nuclear astrophysics, uh, as well as uh, uh, leader of the nuclear astrophysics, uh, understanding the connection between the equation of state and the neutron stars. Um, so, uh, under, made certain that I tell you, his undergrad at Notre Dame, went on to get a PhD at uh, Texas State of Cram, um, postdoc in Illinois, and then to Stony Brook, where he's been ever since. He's a recipient of the Hans Veda Prize. And um, today he's going to tell us about the history of the R process, which connects back with the thesis work, and he tells me um, and even further. So, welcome, and are you, Mike is good? Is this working? I don't know. Are you on? Is it working? Okay. okay. All right. Good. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's been a few years since I've been here, and it's always nice to come back. Um, I wanted to talk about a, my own personal perspective on the R process and some interesting things I've learned about the history of nucleosynthesis. And there's some, I think, pretty interesting history there. So first of all, for those of you who don't already know, I'll try to explain exactly what the R process is. Um, and the story really begins with the first abundance determinations, both of the Earth's crust, then the sun and stars, and meteorites, and finally what we think are the actual cosmic um, abundances of the elements. And along the way, we will see the appearance of certain special numbers, now called magic numbers, and the ultimate development of the nuclear shell model that was able to explain the appearance of these numbers. And it has an important role because um, in heavy element nucleosynthesis, uh, we will see the importance of these numbers in the, uh, because they produce abundance peaks in the, in, the, in the elements. And so there have been very many models for how heavy elements are created in the universe. And the first models were based on supernovae and on Big Bang nucleosynthesis. B squared FH is Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle, very famous reviews of modern physics in 1957. That was really the first comprehensive treatment of the synthesis of each of the elements. And um, this together with a paper by Al Cameron in the same year are, are really the foundations of our, of our field. And the idea of neutron star mergers occurred <coughs> later in my thesis with uh, David Schramm. And um, we now have observations of the R process in uh, metal poor halo stars. Uh, new ideas about ke galactic chemical evolution, the connection between uh, mergers possibly and short gamma ray bursts and the phenomenon known as kilonova appears. Um, there's also been measurements of live radioactivities connected with the R process in the Earth's crust that plays a role. So there's a, a lot of observations that have been accumulating over the past few decades that have changed this paradigm from supernova being the source of the R process to neutron star mergers. And so even though neutron star mergers is kind of a crazy idea, it may in fact be, be correct. And then a lot of this has been validated by the recent observation of the neutron star merger, GW170817. So there's a lot of, a, a lot of sub stories um, in this history. And there's at least 15 Nobel laureates that play a role here, which I've listed beginning with Einstein and ending with uh, uh, Weiss, uh, Barish, and Kip Thorne. So the R process is basically has its roots in the uh, notation that was developed by Burbage, 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 Fowler, and Hoyle that heavy elements are created through the sustained accumulation of neutron captures. And that these captures can either be slow relative to typical beta decay time scales or very rapid. And if the neutron captures are slow, you begin with elements at the end of stellar generation of heavy elements near the iron peak. Those are the most bound nuclei. So as a result of stellar nucleosynthesis in the most massive stars, the last energy generating fusion reactions end with iron peak elements. But if you can continue to capture neutrons uh, beyond that, and they're captured slowly, you will follow the stable nuclei up through the so-called valley of beta stability until fission uh, terminates the cycle um, at uh, atomic numbers around 100. 
However, if the neutron captures are 20 or more orders of magnitude uh, faster, then you follow a completely different trajectory near the neutron drip line, a uh, very neutron rich side of the value of eta stability, and you follow this hatched path here. In both cases, these paths are temporarily suspended or um, altered by the appearance of magic numbers, uh, which indicate extreme um, numbers of neutrons where the nuclei are much more stable, become much more stable. And we now know they're connected with closed shells. And the R process path is affected much more by these magic numbers where the, the path, the, the accumulation of neutrons basically uh, halts um, because beta decays begin to occur just as fast as the neutron captures and then you can continue beyond. And if we blow up a small section of this, of the chart of the nuclei for stable nuclei, which are indicated in yellow here, the S process path follows stable nuclei until you get to an unstable nucleus, you beta decay back to stability, and you keep doing this and you follow and build up the stable nuclei in this order. The ones that are too proton rich to be part of the S process are formed by proton capture reactions, probably in uh, explosions on neutron star surfaces. Uh, the R process, of course, builds up radioactive nuclei along this path, and when the neutron captures end, the beta decays carry those unstable nuclei down towards stability, and so you can form both, uh, you can form nuclei that have the subscript R here. Uh, this nucleus is shielded because no beta decay path will go through, will terminate at this stable nucleus, and so you can't reach this nucleus, so it's S only. But other nuclei can be produced by both processes, S and R, some by only R and some by only S. So we're going to be talking here about the production of the nuclei that are R process. And one thing that is noted here is that as you follow these neutron captures up and you get to the magic numbers, uh, because these nuclei are extra stable, the neutron capture cross sections are quite small. And as a result, a traffic jam develops and you build up the abundances of nuclei at the magic numbers. But the buildup in abundances that occurs here, for example, when you go to stable nuclei, produces an abundance peak that's several mass units below where the magic number is. So there, each magic number then has two abundance peaks connected with it. And when we look at abundances, cosmic abundances, um, we can separate them into the S process and the R process because the S process having a slow equilibrium um, means that the cross section, neutron capture cross section times the abundance of a nucleus in between magic numbers is a constant. And so we can determine the uh, abundances of the S process nuclei from this relationship and subtract from the observed abundances to get the uh, observed R process that's here. And you can see that there are two peaks connected with neutron number 126 with 82 and with 50. So the story really begins with the first determination of elemental abundances. And the first serious attempt at doing a comprehensive analysis was, was Frank Wigglesworth Clark in 1889, who produced this particular chart. And it shows the general trend that as you increase the atomic number, the abundances decrease. But you also see that there are uh, three peaks connected with uh, the now known neutron magic numbers at 50, 82, and 126, or with uh, strontium, barium, and, and lead. But only one peak is apparently visible um, here. Clark eventually got a geochemical abundance unit uh, named after himself. Uh, the next step came with Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, who made the discovery that hydrogen and helium are by far the most abundant elements in stars and in the universe. And she used stellar spectroscopy combined with Saha's equation to uh, demonstrate this. She found that heavier elements comprised about 2% by mass of the abundances of stars. And the relative abundances of heavy elements with a few exceptions were similar to what we see in the Earth's crust. But unfortunately, 
Um, the astronomer Henry Norris Russell, who's famous for the Russell Hertzsprung diagram, um, wrote to her that the light element abundances were probably wrong. And she felt somewhat compelled to write uh, in the publication connected with her thesis that the stellar abundance deduced for these elements is improbably high and is almost certainly not real. Ironically, Russell, with different set of measurements, concluded that she was in fact right and credited her with her discovery. But even today in textbooks, you'll often find connected with the first determination of stellar abundances, Russell's name instead of Payne Gaposchkin's name. The first meteoritic abundances were carried out by Victor Goldschmidt, who was a, uh, a Swiss by birth, and eventually, because of uh, the Nazis, moved to Norway. Uh, but by 1930, he made a compilation of meteoritic abundances. And so this is taken from a paper by um, Hoyle and Fowler, I'm sorry, by, by Gamow and, and, and Alfer, and, uh, but it shows the Goldschmidt abundances, and you can see clearly now the appearance of two peaks connected with these magic numbers. And uh, so this was somewhat of a mystery why the two peaks existed uh, in connection with these, with these numbers, and that gave the beginnings, those abundance determinations basically gave the beginnings to the idea of a nuclear shell, of the nuclear shell model. So a collection of physicists had noticed by the early 1930s that certain nuclei had enhanced stability and also higher abundances at these special numbers. Eugene Wigner, Wigner is apparently credited with the name magic number, but he applied it in a sarcastic sense to this idea. And these physicists tried to explain them by closed nuclear shells. This was a somewhat risky proposition career-wise for shell model people uh, because it competed with the standard paradigm of the collective model, which began with George Gamow's uh, forerunner of the liquid drop model, which he called the water drop model, and uh, further developed by Niels Bohr. And uh, so they ran some risk of, produce, of, of, of uh, doing shell model uh, calculations in those days. But eventually, the modern shell model was developed by uh, Gopert Mayer and Hans Jensen, who, who um, shared the Nobel Prize in 1963. Jensen worked with Otto Haxel and Harold Urey, and Maria Geppert Mayer worked with uh, Hans Seuss, so many of the same people, um, uh, very famous in nuclear physics are, and chemistry are also connected here as well. And it was Enrico Fermi that gave Geppert Mayer the clue of using spin orbit coupling that allowed her to determine finally the correct magic numbers from a mathematical perspective. And it's somewhat ironic that Wigner received the Nobel Prize in the same year as Mayer and Jensen, for, uh, but for unrelated discoveries connected with nuclear physics. So Fred Hoyle was among the earliest to suggest that heavy elements have their origin in the conditions found in core collapse, gravitational collapse supernovae, which are supernovae formed from massive stars at the end of their lives. Um, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma had a competing model connected with the Big Bang, suggesting that heavy elements originate from neutron captures. And um, in this way, they were able to explain large abundances near the neutron magic numbers. And interestingly, um, Alpha and Gamma uh, convinced Hans Beta to be part of this famous Alpha, Beta, Gamma paper simply for the beauty of the name. Uh, Hans didn't really liked the idea much, and, um, but he said in the end, Gamow was very persuasive and uh, convinced him. He did not, however, convince uh, Ralph, uh, Robert Herman, who was also working with them, to change his name to Delta. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have been on this paper as well. But within a year of this, Alpha and Herman made further studies of Big Bang nucleosynthesis and actually came across the, uh, the first predictions due to the changing opacity due to recombination of hydrogen that there would be a residual background radiation that we now call the cosmic background radiation. And they predicted five degrees. 
uh, in their paper, which is very close to the right answer. They haven't been credited with this discovery either from the Nobel Prize that was awarded later, uh, but eventually they did when Alpha and Herman did get some awards for this uh, discovery. Uh, Susan Yuri uh, basically produced uh, the more modern uh, abundance tables by combining knowledge of meteoritic solar and terrestrial data. And this spurred a lot of nuclear physics work uh, uh, after that. And Coriel was one of the first to suggest after looking at these tables and the double peaks, which actually were apparent already in Victor Goldschmidt's 20-year-old um, abundance tables, but not apparently um, taken seriously by everybody. But he developed the idea that these could be produced by neutron captures and the two different peaks would be an obvious result if there were in fact two different processes with widely differing neutron capture fluxes. He also made the interesting observation that if you look only at the abundances of even nuclei or odd nuclei, that the abundances are actually very smooth from one atomic weight to, to another. And um, this indicates that whatever process is working is somehow universal. So this was the immediate forerunner to Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle, who are shown here. Willie Fowler was a train enthusiast, and so he was given this model train uh, at, some, at, at some meeting. And uh, anyway, uh, the story is that Walter Bodd, the same year as Susan Mary, uh, Urey's uh, abundance tables, were produced, uh, uncovered the fact that, that thermonuclear explosions of white dwarfs, which we believe lead to supernovae of type 1, A, I guess now, um, had a roughly 55-day exponential um, half-life um, and uh, light curve decay. And um, Fowler and Hoyle knew that uh, bikini A-bomb tests um, had uh, the appearance of having the, roughly the same kind of decay where a lot of the energy had, was provided by the decay of Californium-254. And so they connected Californium-254 then with type 1 supernovae and therefore suggested that our process uh, is connected with type 1 supernovae and the other type due to gravitational collapse, uh, core collapse explosions, uh, must be responsible for the bulk of elements up to the Iron Peak. Um, Al Cameron, at roughly the same time, argued, no, that they have it backwards, that the R process must originate in type two because supernova one don't collapse to high densities. And he also suggested that this connection with Californium 254 was, was spurious. Um, Hoyle and Fowler in 1960 repeated their assertion about type two, about I'm sorry, this should have been type one, connected with uh, our process. And then later went on to suggest that stars of about 10 to, the four, 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth solar masses may be the source of the R process. Um, Hoyle and Clayton later suggested that the R process could occur on the surfaces of white dwarfs. Hogan, Craig Hogan and J Jim Applegate both suggested in AD7 that one source of the R process could be neutrino-driven winds from compact object accretion disks. They also suggested the idea that the Big Bang was inhomogeneous and that this could lead to the, uh, to, uh, the production of all the heavy elements. The big problem with Gamow's idea of Big Bang nucleosynthesis of the heavy elements is that there are no stable nuclei of masses five and eight. So, the neutron captures basically short circuit beyond helium. And, uh, but if the I Big Bang was in, had large uh, density contrast regions, you could get around this bottleneck. Uh, Seeger, Fowler, and Clayton in 65 suggested it was impossible to make all of the R process peaks in the same event, but they were using models based on fixed densities and temperature. And later Cameron, Arnett, and also SRAM, suggested that explosively expanding conditions in which there was a neutron-rich um, signature uh, would be able to produce all, under certain conditions, would be able to produce all of the R-process peaks. 
So his paper in 73 um, was produced just after he came to Texas as a new faculty member. And um, I went to him, I was working at that time on Joseph's injunctions um, in a millimeter wave laboratory at Texas. And I frankly hated it and really wanted to be a relativity theorist. So I was talking with Dave Schramm and he suggested, well, why don't you work on uh, uh, neutron star mergers? And um, so he suggested that as a result of gravitational radiation decay of their orbits, um, that neutron stars would ultimately coalesce and something interesting could happen. And this was really speculative at the time because neutron stars had just barely been discovered and no neutron stars in binary systems were yet known, although they were being searched for at the time. Um, Schramm was certainly no, Nate, no stranger to risky propositions. He, he was a pilot. He climbed mountains. He had climbed the tallest mountain on every continent except Asia. Um, he explored caves. Uh, he was a rugby, rugby player. In fact, he once he told me in the beginning I couldn't work for him unless I also played rugby, and I resisted, <laughs> resisted that. And he was also a wrestler, an Olympic class wrestler. In fact, he dropped off the Olympic, US Olympic team in order to complete his thesis. And he later coached the Caltech uh, wrestling team. Um, so, and this was certainly a risky uh, thing to, 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 to study at the time. I decided to change the project to using a black hole in, as a companion to the neutron star from the sheer point of expediency. I could use the black hole presumably would be more massive than the neutron star, if only by a factor of three, and therefore it would be somewhat justified if I use the black hole as a general relativistic background and treated the neutron star as a Newtonian object uh, moving in this background. Um, I felt a little comfortable with this because you, could, you can easily show that because of the larger radii of neutron stars, that a merger between two neutron stars would produce even larger tidal effects than between a black hole and a neutron star. So that if something interesting happened with a black hole neutron star binary, you could be assured that even more interesting things would happen with neutron stars. Anyway, we found that crudely about a 20th of a solar mass of neutron star matter would be tidally ejected, at least ejected to escape velocity and that further accelerations to the matter would be result as a res because it's known that neutron stars have a minimum mass of a tenth of a solar mass. So small pieces of neutron star matter that are ejected are going to dynamically decompress because the ambient pressure in such objects is negative. And um, so it's likely that this matter will dynamically decompress, escape, and form our process nuclei and the amounts of these connected with the estimated rates of mergers, which would be something like one ten thousandth to one one hundred thousandth, the rate of supernovae um, would um, form our process in sufficient amounts to explain their abundances. Now this was of course speculative because it requires uh, first of all, that you have two supernovae in one binary system and that the binary is still intact after those supernovae occur. The most likely uh, situation is that when you have a supernova explode in a binary, so much mass is ejected that the binary is disrupted. But in about 1% of the cases, it's estimated that because of the small kick velocity connected with inhomogeneous mass ejection from the supernova, momentum conservation would require that the supernova require a small kick. And if this kick is oriented oppositely to the orbital motion, you can produce a stable binary, resulting binary at the end in which the system is actually more compact than it was to begin with. And if this occurs twice in 1% of 1% of the cases, uh, then you will have a result of a very compact binary composed of two neutron stars. The system will be so compact that the gravitational decay time will be on the order of the age of the universe or less in most cases. So maybe it wasn't that crazy. 
So the timing of this was interesting, and I hadn't really appreciated this until recently, but we submitted our paper in March of 74, and it was published in September of 74. Um, the first binary pulsar was discovered by Hulse and Taylor in July of 74, and it was realized actually to be a bi in a binary only in September. So the pulsar itself was discovered in July but uh, realized to be in a binary in September. And then finally it was submitted in October and published in January of 75. So SRAM had this idea well before any observational information about binary uh, neutron stars was, was, had been uncovered. Uh, we had a statement in our paper that, um, not this paper, but one in 76, that perhaps gamma ray bursts were connected with mergers. Um, but gamma ray bursts had only been discovered a few years beforehand, and it was widely believed that they were galactic objects. And we realized that these explosions of involving mergers would be so powerful, there is no way they could explain gamma ray bursts. They would be much too powerful. So instead of turning the argument around and suggesting that these objects thought to be of galactic origin were in fact extra galactic, which would resolve the energetics conflict, we punted and basically said that they aren't connected. So decompression gives a natural R process. Here's a figure from the uh, paper I wrote with Fred Mackey and Jeff Ravenhall together with SRAM, where basically you begin with matter in the interior of a neutron star above nuclear saturation density. It's a fluid, but as it decompresses and expands, there's not enough time for any beta decays to occur. And so when you fall below um, the saturation density, you get to the uh, nuclear instability region where the pressure of uniform matter becomes negative. And so instead you form clusters or fragments, nuclear fragments, and the proton fraction will be connected with whatever number, whatever shell physics would predict would be the magic number at under those conditions, which we thought may be around 50, but could be 30 or something like that. But if it's 50, you basically, a nucleus will continue to have Zia 50 as it continues to expand. And as it moves to lower density regions, nuclear equilibrium requires that it decrease in mass and until you get close to the uh, uh, neutron drip line and just past it, when uh, beta decays will begin and then the proton number will increase. And as you increase the proton number, you then start to capture neutrons instead of ejecting them. And then you follow a path that goes up this way till you get to fission. The fission fragments will come back down here. If they're symmetric, they'll be here. If they're asymmetric, they'll be spread out along here and you continue to capture neutrons and you keep moving up. And as you change the density of the neutrons, you move from this lower path to the an upper path, finally you run out of neutrons and the nuclei will decay by beta decays back to beta stability as we saw and make. So it, it makes all of the R process nuclei, all three peaks along here and going back up to uh, stability. So it, 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 has, it almost has to work. And of course, nobody believed it. The favorite site has always been supernovae. Um, one reason is that if supernovae make R process, they're so much more abundant that you need to produce less than 10 to the minus fifth solar masses per supernova. Furthermore, observations of metal poor and presumably the oldest stars in the galaxy uh, that accumulated in the late 70s and 80s show in fact all of these old stars almost all of these old stars also have R process elements. And in the same relative proportions as in the solar system. So the R process has been operating apparently for as long as stars have been around. And furthermore, it hasn't apparently changed with time. And this early onset of the R process seems very difficult to reconcile with the long time delay between supernovae which make metals in the initial neutron stars and the eventual merger of those neutron stars, which could take 10 or hundreds of millions of years. 
And furthermore, you need substantial mass ejections, several hundreds of a solar mass per merger to explain observed abundances. So there already were two important strikes against, against mergers uh, almost to begin with. So this is taken from a summary in 2008 showing several metal poor stars which have metallicities around Fe over H of about minus three, which means that the abundances of heavy elements, iron and so on, are less abundant than in the sun by a factor of a thousand or more. And as because of their extremely small iron abundance, they must be fairly old stars. And the lines here are the solar system R process abundances. They're shifted from case to case just to preserve clarity of the figure, but you can see the abundances in these different stars match fairly well the odd even pattern and other characteristics, the peaks and so forth of the uh, of the uh, our process observed in the sun and uh, in meteorites. So the chemical evolution problem is probably the most, one of the most important problems. Uh, it's summarized here in a paper by Argos et al in 2004. If you run a galactic chemical evolution model in which the Milky Way builds up iron from the beginning by supernovae um, over time. Um, the uh, red dots here show um, observations of the abundance of our process barium on the vertical axis on a log scale versus the iron abundance in this units that mean the abundance of iron relative to hydrogen in log units compared to the sun. So minus three means one one thousandth of solar abundance of iron and one minus one means one tenth. And the black dots are um, simulated stars evolving in this galaxy. And you can see that the observations line up fairly well with the predicted observed, with the predicted abundances in the simulation. On the other hand, if you assume that the R process comes only from neutron star mergers, then the simulated stars only accumulate R process material by the time stars of Fe over H of minus two have been produced, but not earlier. And this is completely opposite, uh, different from what is observed. Shen and, and Wasserberg collected a number of, of lesser arguments against mergers involving energetics and mixing, and also um, knowledge of specific isotopic abundances in meteorites from our process elements that suggested that um, they were incompatible with the merger hypothesis. And even up till 2015, there were many galactic chemical evolution models that emphasized the uh, extreme difficulties of making neutron star mergers work in uh, these kinds of galactic chemical evolution models. One small argument in favor of a very rare source for the R process and possibly mergers is the observation that if you look at R process abundances compared to iron, again in the log scale, so that this is the same, where the R process and iron abundances are in the same ratio as observed in the sun, here the R process is enhanced by a factor of 10, and here it's, um, they're less abundant by a factor of about three. But as we go back in time, we find that the scatter between um, the R uh, reflected in R process abundances compared to iron increases with time in the past, which is indicative of a rare source as opposed to a more frequent source. Supernovae have also historically had the problem that they don't work as R process sources from a theoretical perspective. The problem is that neutrinos basically uh, protonize the ejected matter and, and leave it either less neutron rich than it was or even proton rich. And then you can't run an R process in that ejecta. And um, so the, the problem that neutrinos tend to convert the neutrons in the ejecta back to protons 
is, is, is a difficulty. So models today mostly rely on combinations of rapid rotation or, and or strong magnetic fields that could result in the ejection of neutron rich matter that would not be poisoned in this way. But such events are believed to be rare and would require the synthesis of a lot of our process matter in each event. So that may be um, unlikely. And there are some experts in this room that have studied this problem and they could comment on that if they want. But it, it would seem that supernovae do have a difficulty making the R process unless you turn the dials a bit. In the middle of the 2000s, though, a, a shift in the way that we understand how our Milky Way formed came about. So instead of forming as a massive object in the beginning, it seems to have been formed from small pieces. This is called hierarchical galaxy formation. And in such simulations of this kind of synthesis of the elements in, um, in, in these little pieces, which then merge to form the large spiral and elliptical galaxies we see today, basically breaks this unique relation between time and metallicity. So simply because the metallicity or iron abundance is small doesn't necessarily mean the object is particularly old. And so the observed appearance, early appearance in metal poor stars of our elements um, could be explained even if you have large time delays between the first supernovae and the first mergers. And so new galactic chemical evolution models that, that take into account this hierarchical formation seem to agree somewhat better Here's a model with neutron star mergers. Again, the dots are the, are the observations and the yellow colors, the, the colors are uh, contours of, of, uh, the, that show the populations of predicted stars. And uh, so you can see that there's a somewhat better agreement. You can get um, formation of, uh, of uh, the R process early on in galactic history, early on in terms of Fe over H. But ever since our work in the mid 70s on neutron star mergers, it hasn't been completely abandoned. SRAM continued with students to work on the idea. They, uh, Symbolisti, Myers, and SRAM extended the black hole neutron star calculations to binary neutron stars by treating the neutron stars as operating in a pseudo relativistic background. Um, a, an interesting paper by Eichler, Livio, uh, Zvi Peron, and Dave Schramm suggested that, in fact, mergers could be connected with gamma ray bursts. Leon Pachinsky went a step further and suggested that the ejecta from uh, these mergers uh, would involve radioactive decays and they could power optical transients so that there might be optical transients connected with the, in the aftermath of gamma ray bursts. Um, theoretical calculations by Thielman and Ross Wag and Freiberghaus, beginning in the late 90s, um, began to use the first real hydrodynamics, either single particle hydrodynamics or fluid hydrodynamics in a Newtonian or, and later uh, general relativistic background, uh, confirmed that ejection was likely following mergers and that the resulting decompression uh, would make the R process and they used more detailed network calculations. We used the most probable nucleus approximation. They used a whole set of nuclei in their networks to come to the same conclusions. The first general relativistic neutron star simulations were done by Shibata and company in 2003. Um, later work by Metzger et al, 2010, in collaboration with uh, Almudina Arconis and Gabriel um, 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 Pinedo, uh, showed that the um, optical transients after a merger would accompany uh, uh, short gamma ray bursts. And a major breakthrough was, happened in 2013 when it was realized by two different groups, Barnes and Kaysen and Tanaka and Hoda Kazawa, that uh, lanthanides, which are our process nuclei between the second and third peaks, um, 
have, su have the highest opacity of all chemical elements, and the optical emission would in fact be delayed and shifted to infrared, so that we should be looking for infrared transients rather than optical transients following um, uh, the short gamma ray bursts. So it's been known for a long time that gamma ray bursts come in two classifications. They either have a relatively short duration from a hundredth of a second to a few seconds or longer than a few seconds. Those are the red ones, which are more frequent. And uh, it turns out that the short gamma ray bursts also are spectrally harder. This spectral hardness is a ratio of high energy photons to low energy photons. And um, the long gamma ray bursts are uh, spectrally softer. So there seem to be two different sources for these uh, gamma ray bursts. And the long gamma ray bursts have, long, have been connected with supernovae because many long gamma ray bursts have been observed with supernovae that appear in the, after, uh, in the aftermath. No supernova has ever been connected with a short gamma ray burst. And in addition, short gamma ray bursts are primarily located in elliptical galaxies, or at least far from re regions of recent star formation and massive stars and, and supernovae themselves. So this connection with mergers has become more robust now that some infrared afterglows have been observed from at least one and possibly two or three other short gamma ray bursts in the last few years. The what? Yeah, this is GW170817. So Leon Pachinsky's idea has received a lot of attention that the gamma ray burst afterglows produced from the heated R process ejecta uh, would be downscattered to eventually appear as optical emission. And the more recent work suggests that the high opacities will downgrade the radiation further into the infrared. And so this is the case of gamma ray burst 130603b uh, uh, that was observed that uh, there's a single data point that suggests uh, an infrared emission um, uh, roughly uh, several hours uh, uh, well, no, several days, few, almost 10 to the six seconds after, um, after the uh, event. But since it's a single data point, this is a very weak uh, observational demonstration of, of an after, of, an, of a predict, of a, of a kilonova. So in 2014, Walner et al. made the first um, uh, determinations of um, plutonium-244 in the Earth's crust. Previous work had established upper limits for the plutonium-244 abundance. Uh, but their works showed that the upper limits, and these also have lower limits here, um, are in fact uh, much smaller than the previous upper limits. Now, depending on how the plutonium-244, which is a radioactive isotope that's produced by the R process, is created, it will be observed to have either a high abundance in the Earth's crust or a relatively low abundance. So here's a blackboard argument by S.V. Peron. If you have a radioactive element produced in an event, if the events are rare, you're more likely to see it when the, uh, a lot of decay has occurred, and so the abun its abundance is going to be relatively small. On the other hand, if the radioactive isotope is produced in much fr more frequent events, you're going to be likely to observe a relatively high abundance. And so the idea is that the plutonium-244 is created in its source as the ex explosively expanding material, either from a merger or a supernova, expands and cools you form dust. So the plutonium-244 is then retained in dust particles, which eventually find their way into the solar system and eventually into the atmosphere of the Earth, and they settle out in, uh, in sediments and, uh, and the Earth's crust or on ocean floors. So supernova models of the creation of the R process would have predicted an amount of plutonium-244 in the Earth's crust 
that are up here, but the observations are clearly below that. So this is an indication that this isotope, an R process isotope, is produced by a rare event rather than by a, a standard supernova. So it's evidence either in favor of the merger scenario or a rare kind of supernova. One of the strongest interesting pieces of information comes from the study of so-called ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. So we have galaxies that like the Milky Way have masses of about a trillion solar masses. We have dwarf galaxies, which are about one ten thousandth of the mass of a galaxy. And then we have ultra faint dwarf galaxies, which are another four orders of magnitude in mass, less massive than dwarf galaxies. They're very difficult to see. Let's see if I have a, a picture. So here's reticulum two, it's an ultra faint dwarf galaxy. Here's the field where it exists but it can only be identified by finding the few stars in this field that are moving as a collection uh, di in, uh, with different proper motions than the rest of the star and moving together. So when you remove the rest of the stars, you can see the ultra-faint dwarf galaxy in the background. So these galaxies tend to be metal poor. They have iron to hydrogen ratios in the range from 1 100th to 1 10,000th of a solar mass, and, uh, but they have iron, so they certainly have had supernova produced in them. But only one out of the 10 first uh, that ultra-faint galaxies that were observed had stars in them that had any R process material at all. So this implies that whatever's producing the R process must be rare because it didn't happen so far in, 10 of the, in nine of the ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, but in only one of them. And so the implication is that the number of neutron star mergers is less than about 10, uh, a thousandth the frequency of, um, I mean, of, of supernovae. So here we see the mass of iron compared to the luminosity of, the, these, dwarf gal of these galaxies, which is an indicator of their masses. So here we have dwarf galaxies and ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. They all lie on the same trend line, indicating that supernovae are occurring at the same rate per unit stellar mass in both systems. But when we look at our process, and as measured by europium, compared to, again, the mass of the galaxy, we see the R process in all of these dwarf galaxies along this trend. But when we come down here, only reticulum 2 has any detectable R process in it. And e at a slightly elevated rate compared to this trend. And these other faint dwarf galaxies have no detectable R process. So this is very strong evidence in favor of either a rare supernova or a merger formation for the R process. So this just summarizes what I just said. The what? Oh, these are individual stars in those galaxies. The brightest stars in those galaxies. That's true. So they can only they only look at the brightest stars in these systems. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. These are for the entire the estimated amount of iron in the in the whole system. Okay, from summing over all the observed stars. Okay, and again, this is the amount of europium in all of the stars in each system. And none of these systems had any stars, but this system had several, as shown here, uh, here. And they add up to an amount of europium that is equivalent to what one merger would have ejected. So the total amount of R process in reticulum two seems to be about 10 to the minus two solar masses. Okay. So another thing you could, that Svi Peron produced was this, basically this crude diagram. We have the total observed abundances of R process elements in meteorites 
and in the, in the sun. And uh, so the rate of, mer of the producer, of the source of the site of the, of the R process times the amount ejected in each event has to be a, a, a constant. And depending on your galactic evolutionary model, the current rate is probably lower than the average rate because supernovae and mergers were probably more frequent in the past than they are today. And so depending on whether it's three times, the average is, is uh, different from the current rate by factors of three or five, you get these different curves. And so the, the number on the scale here is the number of events uh, per million years per Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so this would be one event in our galaxy per million years, and this would be a thousand, and this is the amount of ejecta in solar masses. Okay. So I'll come back to that diagram uh, later. So GW170817 was truly a unique event, um, but it shouldn't be given the classification as the first multi-messenger astronomy event, okay? So I credit that with Ray Davis, at least the first multi-messenger observation combining electromagnetic and neutrino information, and the first event was supernova 1987A. And of course, this is the data from 87A before and after, and a total of about 20 neutrinos observed over a time period of about 10 seconds from which you can estimate that the total neutrino energy was about equal to the binding energy of the neutron star that was formed. The duration was much longer than the free escape time, which was only 40 microseconds. So it shows that neutrinos became trapped and completely consistent with a proto-neutron star having formed. But that's not to detract from the importance of GW170817 which carried this multi-messenger astronomy to really unprecedented levels. So the predicted signal from a neutron star merger of a total mass of 2.73 solar masses was pretty much exactly what was observed in gravitational waves. So this is roughly twice of one point, the canonical 1.4 solar mass neutron star, which is the average uh, mass of neutron stars observed in binary pulsar systems was also observed in gamma rays by both the Fermi and the integral telescopes as a short gamma ray burst that followed 1.7 seconds after the merger. And it appears that the remnant quickly collapsed to a black hole. And once you correct for binding energy, the mass loss of e in ejecta and the rotational support that the rapidly rotating final system would have had before the collapse to the black hole suggests that the mass of the uh, remnant exceeded the maximum stable cold neutron star mass. Uh, and you can, then you can estimate what that mass would be. And it turns out to be between 2.1 and 2.2 solar masses, which is very interesting because since we observe pulsars with masses practically up to two solar masses, this seems to fix the upper limit to the maximum mass as well, you know, only a little bit above the largest neutron star mass found. So this is an important, if this turns out to be true, which I think we'll get more confirmation of this as we observe more and more merger events. Um, if it turns out to be true, then this suggests that we understand a lot more about the high density equation of state. This is a very tight constraint on how the pressure changes with density above a few times the saturation density. We also saw this kilonova um, afterglow in ultraviolet optical and infrared radiation involving more than 100 telescopes. And this was pretty much the predicted signal from a kilonova as shown in the Metzger 2010 paper, uh, powered by the radioactive decay of about a 20th of a solar mass. And there were also observations in X-rays, millimeter wave, and radio. So this one merger event can be translated into a rate. You know, that's problematic, of course. 
So there's a big error bar for the estimated rate. But if we put this back in Perron's picture, where the obser observations have to lie somewhere within this green band, the gravitational wave event with this estimated rate and the knowledge of the estimated ejected mass from the optical observations is shown as this blue box. Uh, the ultra dwarf, ultra faint dwarf galaxy estimated rate and uh, ejection, ejected mass lies in these elliptical contours here. We have the plutonium results from the Earth's crust that would be consistent with a merger rate times ejection rate uh, that lies somewhere within this triangle. And everything seems to line up with, with um, a result that would be consistent with this and much, much below what a supernova production of the R process where you'd need to be over here. So the question is if, if every supernova. So if it's a fraction of supernova, then this curve moves down. So it could still be a rare supernova that ejected, you know, 10,000 times the average. That's right. And future events, I think, will give us a better handle on, on that. So if indeed the R process does come from merging neutron stars, then we can update the origin of the elements in this way. We're ignoring the gray radioactive elements. Uh, we now have a reasonable uh, description of the fraction of each element that's produced in uh, various ways. So the last thing I, I wanted to show are results that I've been working on with the gravitational wave event in terms of predicting the masses and the radii of the underlying neutron stars. So the idea is that from the gravitational wave signal, neutron stars have finite size and therefore they will exhibit tidal effects on each other during the in-spiral and they will speed the in-spiral up because of friction. And so if that small change in the gravitational wave frequency with in-spiraling in time is examined, you can extract a so-called tidal deformability of the neutron star and then connect that to the underlying equation of state and then to the mass and radii. So this shows such a attempt and we can then produce contours of the underlying masses and radii of the two neutron stars in the system. Most likely the two neutron stars had roughly the same mass. That's why there's these two different distributions with centroids here and here. But even if they didn't have the same mass, you can see that the predicted radii are fairly equal for both of them and in the range of somewhere between nine and uh, thir 12 or 13 kilometers. So these contours are 95%, 90, um, uh, 68, and 50%. Uh, confidence um, intervals. So it's interesting that this one event, if we can believe this analysis, suggests a uncertainty in the predicted radii of neutron stars that's probably better than all of the accumulated X-ray data to the, to the present time. And if we get 10 more events, we'll be able to stack them because they should be similar systems and behave similarly and we should be able to reduce the error bars considerably. So the future looks very bright for this kind of um, astronomy in terms of gravitational wave astronomy. And of course, the ultimate question is going to be whether or not this model for the production of the R process stands the test of time. Future mergers should be consistent with this idea in both terms of rate and amounts of ejection. So those are definite predictions that have to be fulfilled. Otherwise, we're back to the drawing board. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we're a little bit over time because it's late. This is a good time for some questions. So sorry. Um, what's on the drawing board?
then we're back to some kind of crazy supernova model. Okay. Uh, the other models, the inhomogeneous Big Bang doesn't seem to uh, pass muster for various reasons. The surfaces of white dwarfs, everything else is uh, connected with supernova somehow. <laughs> There is this um, other issue with the delay times distribution uh, impacting the high metallicity that would be from the mm -hmm. so People pointed out that it seems incompatible with. Uh, yeah, so there are certain details of. That you need when you look in detail at some of the observations, they seem a little um, hard to reconcile, but I'm not sure how seriously to take all of these objections at this point. I, I, I don't think further theoretical arguments are going to settle this question. It's going to depend on observations. So I think we just have to wait. Um, yeah, Hendrick, I think, knows more, probably knows more about the measurements of metal poor stars, uh, just being involved with GNAP so closely. <laughs> but um, yeah, only a few of the, of the stars in each galaxy have been analyzed, only the ones that are bright enough to do the spectroscopy. But I think as more time is spent analyzing those systems, we'll have better control over it. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see if the fainter stars show the same um, characteristics. So Gina's working hard. There'll be hundreds more. But is Gina going to focus on ultra faint dwarf galaxies, or are they focusing more on halo stars? Oh, you mean ultra faint? Yeah. Because these ultra faint systems kind of came out of the blue, right? They weren't even known, <laughs> what, five years ago. So it was a really interesting set of observations connected with. And I think the mystery in the beginning was why don't they show our process elements? They have low metallicity, so they're completely different from halo stars in that sense. So it makes you think that if there are so many of these ultra faint dwarf galaxies that merge into ours, where are those our process depleted halo stars that might be there? So there, there are questions on, on both sides. Great, are there any other questions? Uh, Thank you again.